Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me okay? All right. Um, welcome, Vice Council Flanagan. Uh, welcome, members of Glucksman Ireland House Advisory Board. And welcome, everyone, to the launch of the 25th anniversary edition of Dr. Kevin Kenny's Making Sense of the Molly Maguires. We're all so delighted to welcome you here this evening. Um, if I could just ask everyone at this time to silence any cell phones or electronic devices, um, just make sure those are off, that would be great. Um, events like these are made possible through the generous support of our membership program. So for the past 30 years, we've, had, we've been very fortunate enough to have a very vibrant public membership program. Um, during the pandemic, when the house was closed, a lot of those memberships kind of lapsed a little bit. So we'd like to invite you this evening to consider renewing your membership with us. Um, and anyone who does renew tonight will receive a copy of the 25th anniversary edition of the Making Sense of the Molly McGuire. So please see us afterwards if you are interested in that at all. Um, the Department of History at New York University, where Dr. Kevin Kenny holds his faculty appointment, acknowledges that this is located in ancestral Lanape homelands, and it recognizes the longstanding significance of these lands for the Lanape uh, nations past and present. We are also conscious that New York City has the largest urban native population in the United States, and we believe that the historical awareness of indigenous exclusion and erasure is critically important, and we are committed to working to overcome their effects in our own educational institutions. Now let me introduce our speakers. So Dr. Kevin Kenny is Glucksman Professor of History at New York University and Director of Glucksman Ireland House. He received his undergraduate degree in modern history from the University of Edinburgh, and his PhD in US history from Columbia University. Professor Kenny's books include The American Irish, A History, Peaceable, A Kingdom Lost, The Paxton Boys, and the Destruction of William Penn's Holy Experiment. That's from Oxford in 2009. Diaspora, A Very Short Introduction, also Oxford in 2013. The Problem of Immigration in a Slaveholding Republic, Policing Mobility in the 19th Century, United States, also Oxford, uh, 2023. There's, a, there's an Oxford trend here. <laughs> um, in addition, he edited Ireland and the British Empire, also Oxford in 2004, and serves as general editor of the Glucksman Irish Diaspora series with NYU Press. And you can find some of the books from the Glucksman series uh, displayed downstairs. Professor Kenny currently serves as president of the Immigration and Ethnic History Society and as a distinguished lecturer of the Organization of American Historians. Earlier this month, Oxford University Press published a 25th anniversary edition of his first book, Making Sense of the Molly Maguire, is the subject of the lecture this evening. And we congratulate him on that. Mark Bulick, uh, who will say a few introductory words before the lecture, is a senior editor at the New York Times. He started at the National Desk in 1997 and has supervised the Sunday front page and the home page of the Times website. He was designated the newsroom's headline coach uh, headline coach seven years ago and is currently a member of the standards team deciding language and ethical issues and exactly what news is fit to print. A native of Eastern Pennsylvania, he comes from a long line of Irish American anthracite miners and is the author of The Sons of Molly Maguire, The Irish Roots of America's First Labor War, which was published in 2015, and Ambush at Central Park when the IRA came to New York in 2023. Now I'd like to invite uh, Ellen Flanagan, Ireland's Vice Consul to New York City to the podium. Thank you. Thank you so much, Caroline. And thoughts and down arm of Ian Shaw Nacht, Ellen Lanagan is Anam Dom. My name is Ellen Flanagan. It's a real pleasure to be with you here this evening. Um, and I'm delighted to be here to celebrate the incredible partnership that the, the consulate has with the Glucksman Ireland Centre and also to celebrate what is an incredible achievement um, by Professor Kenny this evening. We've got an incredible audience here this evening. We have our former ambassador to the US, Anne Anderson, and also our colleague, uh, Ted Smith. So really a, a huge turnout to celebrate this achievement. And we really, we really want to continue to support you at the Ireland, um, at the Ireland House in your encouragement of Irish diaspora, the study of Irish diaspora, Irish America, and also the Irish language, which is really important to us at the consulate. So through the immigrant support program and everything, we will continue to support that and we really appreciate your work. And it's really incredible to be here this evening to focus on this authoritative text about the Molly Maguire's by Professor Kenny. We understand more and more these days that it's really critical to look back on the past with a critical lens and to tell stories about our history in our own words and that is exactly what 
Professor Kenny has done through his book, and we're really excited to listen to that tonight. Um, and it's really brought a story and a tale of Irish history to generations now, um, over a quarter of a century, so we're really excited to hear about it here tonight. And it's a real work of Irish-American historiography, and it's a real, I think, testament to the, the rigour and academia of the professor that it is still a current text, and we're really interested to hear more about your analysis tonight of Irish immigration. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Mark, who's also an expert on the Molly Maguires in his own right. So thank you so much for having me here tonight. Hear me over. I violated the phone rule because my little talk is, is, is here on my phone. So, um, uh, so we're here tonight to celebrate, um, you know, the 25th anniversary of, of Kevin's groundbreaking first book, Making Sense of the Molly Maguires, which was about a violent Irish secret society that uh, was active on, on both sides of the Atlantic. But um, this month also just happens to be the 29th anniversary of my very first conversation with Kevin on this subject. Um, in October of 1994, I was working on a chapter about one of the most obscure topics imaginable, uh, Schuylkill County, Pennsylvania politics in the 1850s. Um, and uh, <clears throat> it was for a book about, uh, uh, that took forever to finish, about the origins of the Molly Maguires. Um, the mail arrived that day. In the mail was the Journal of uh, the Pennsylvania Historical Society. And in this copy was um, an article about Schuylkill County, Pennsylvania politics in the 1850s by some professor in Texas named Kevin Kenny. Um, so obviously I had to call this guy. Um, and as I recall, we had a, a rather lengthy, if somewhat wary conversation about, you know, the Molly Maguires. Um, it, it was, uh, you know, a, a topic that I had been uh, researching for most of my adult life because my mother uh, came from a long line of Irish coal miners in Schuylkill County, Pennsylvania, where the Molly Maguires got started. In fact, they were from the very township where the Molly Maguires were resurrected in Pennsylvania in the 1860s. And they actually worked at the mine <laughs> where um, the Phoenix Park Colliery, which is one of the very first places where the Molly Maguires turned up. Um, so, uh, you know, I've been um, very interested in this. And, and uh, you know, getting your brain wrapped around the Molly Maguires is difficult. Um, they were different things in different places at, at different times. Um, you know, in, in Ireland, they defended uh, the peasantry from eviction during the horrors of the Great Famine. In Pennsylvania, they kind of started off as a um, ethnic political machine, not unlike Tammany Hall. Um, then they were a clandestine labor union for mine workers. Um, then they got involved in Civil War draft resistance. And then in the 1870s, they were painted as a secret society of assassins who would go after mine officials and, and local officials. So um, Kevin's book, uh, Making Sense of the Molly Maguires, did exactly what his title promised. It picked its way through this minefield very carefully, very intelligently. Plenty of earlier writers uh, had weighed in on the subject, but few employed the skepticism that Kevin brought to the official sources, which were deeply tainted. Um, and uh, few of them got into the Irish context of the violence as, as keenly as, as Kevin's did. Um, it helped that he had the good sense to cite one of my papers, uh, you know, uh, in, in that discussion. So, um, 
you know, since that first book, uh, Kevin has written several others. Um, uh, he's shed light on the history of both Pennsylvania and the nation. Uh, Peaceable Kingdom Lost explored, you know, the the um, the death. Actually, you could call it the massacre of of William Penn's dream of living in harmony with Native Americans. Um, his latest book, The Problem of Immigration in a Slaveholding Republic, touched on, actually touched on some of the same themes that that 1994 article that sparked our first conversation did. Um, that, title, that, that article was titled Nativism, Labor, and Slavery. Um, so um, since all of this great scholarship got started with making sense of the Molly Maguires, and since the Molly Maguires got started in uh, Cass Township, Pennsylvania, uh, I thought I would present Kevin with a little memento from <laughs> Cass Township, Pennsylvania. Uh, take away from all those weighty papers that he was uh, uh, taking a look at. And um, I just wanted to uh, end on one note, and that is just speaking as a journalist, I have to say that, that for a historian of 18th and 19th century America, Kevin has an incredibly keen eye for the issues that are making headlines in 21st century America. You know, race, immigration, labor, just bravo. Thank you so much, Mark. Uh, thank you, Vice Council Flanagan. Uh, thank you also to the members of the advisory board uh, in Glaxman Ireland House, uh, friends, students, and colleagues. Um, this is uh, Black Diamond, right? Uh, I can rub my hands on this. There's no dust coming off. This is this is the purest uh, form of coal. It's very different from bituminous or lignite coal. Actually, the next stage in the geological process is diamonds, pure, pure carbon. Uh, so this is, this is a black diamond. <laughs> and uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Mark, for that. Um, curious uh, footnote to history as well is that what I'm holding here uh, are my notes uh, from the launch of this book uh, when it came out in 1998 from this podium. Uh, so I imagine I'm the only one to have launched the same book twice <laughs> in, in Ireland has, and I guess I have the prerogative and the privilege to do that as uh, I never expected to be director of Glaxman Ireland House when I was here starting out uh, 25 years ago when I, when I met uh, Mark. Um, the slides got moved in the introduction and this guy has been dominating the conversation. <laughs> He'll come back into the, uh, the conversation uh, uh, very quickly and you'll see why I refer to him in that way. So, um, that one page of notes that I showed you, I must have been very brief and uh, concise and eloquent in those days or else I just extemporized. I think it was a short piece. Uh, I am gonna give you the full lecture uh, 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 this evening. So. 20 Irishmen were hanged in the anthracite region of northeast Pennsylvania in the late 1870s, convicted of a series of 16 killings that stretched back to the Civil War. The convicted men were said to be members of a secret society called the Molly Maguires. Hostile contemporaries described the Molly Maguires as inherently savage Irish immigrants who had imported a violent conspiratorial organization that had no place in industrial America. Challenges to that nativist myth in the first half of the 20th century produced a counter myth that transposed the category of evil from the immigrants to their exploiters, casting the Irish as innocent victims of economic, religious, or ethnic oppression. And neither of those interpretations makes historical sense. The Molly Maguires were not depraved killers, but neither were they figments of the nativist or anti-labor imagination. They never existed as the conspiracy imagined by uh, their enemies, but they did use violence to combat their exploitation. 
20 Irish men died on the scaffold, 16 other men were killed as well. And their killers, whatever they may have called themselves, became known in history as the Molly Maguires. And in writing their history, I set out to determine uh, who they were and what they did. So there were, um, in Pennsylvania, two distinct waves of violence, and Mark Bulick has written uh, most intensively about the first of those phases, which occurred during the Civil War. Um, six of the 16 men who died, who were, who were killed, um, died either during the Civil War or directly afterwards. And at the heart of that violence in the 1860s was a combination of resistance to the military draft, a bit like the draft riots here in New York City, and some form of rudimentary labor organizing by a shadowy group known variously in the sources as the committee, the buckshots, or the Molly Maguires. Nobody was convicted of those crimes at the time. They were tr traced retroactively to the Molly Maguires in the late 1870s, and that's a significant part of the story. The second wave of violence occurred in, in the mid-1870s mid and featured um, three overlapping forms of violence. The first was a form of ethnic gang, gang warfare, especially between the Irish and the Welsh. The Welsh had the skilled jobs. The Irish often worked as laborers. Secondly, attacks on public officials, including magistrates and policemen. Thirdly, attacks on mine superintendents and foremen. Molly Maguire's were hanged largely on the evidence of this man, uh, an undercover Pinkerton detective, James McParlin, who entered the uh, Pennsylvania anthracite region, infiltrated the organization, and by informing against his countrymen, violated one of the cardinal norms of Irish culture. Few figures are more hated in Irish history than the informant. Uh, there are a lot of informants in Irish history. <laughs> that tells you something about the colonial uh, relationship because they were uh, employed in certain ways. Now, in his reports from uh, the anthracite region, McParlin linked the Molly Maguires to a fraternal ethnic organization that you will have heard of called the Ancient Order of Hibernians, the AOH. It, st it still exists. Most of the convicted Molly Maguires were members of the AOH. And it is clear from the sources, even allowing for McParlin's distortions, that some of them used local lodges of the OAH for violent and not simply fraternal purposes. Establishing this connection between a loosely organized pattern of violence on the one hand and an ethnic institution with national and indeed international reach on the other hand had devastating consequences for the Molly Maguires, because it equipped them with an institutional structure way out of proportion to their actual members in Pennsylvania. This was grist for the mill of conspiracy theorists in the 19th century and ever since, because it allowed them to magnify the threat posed by a small, desperate, and often misguided group of immigrant workers. Contemporaries portrayed the Molly Maguires as a vast, well-organized movement directly imported from Ireland, hell-bent on subverting American liberty and democracy. The prosecution offered no plausible explanation of motive at the trials, and nor, it seems, was one expected. The explanation of Irish depravity was that the Irish were depraved by nature. They killed people because that's the kind of people they were. Now, this argument, while perfectly circular, was surprisingly powerful in mid-19th century America. Contemporaries denounced Irish-American violence from the labor upheavals and urban rioting of the antebellum period through the draft riots, the Fenian movement, the orange and green riots here in New York City in 1870 and 1871. They denounced all of this, and there was violence uh, in 19th century Irish-America. They denounced it as the logical transatlantic outgrowth of allowing an alien immigrant culture to take root in the United States. Alan Pinkerton, who sent James McParlin, the detective, uh, into the mining region as uh, an undercover agent,
published the first history of the Molly Maguires in 1877, even as the trials and executions were still underway. Pinkerton's ghost-written book, The Molly Maguires and the Detectives, laid down the foundational myth, inherently depraved Irish immigrant brought to justice by an intrepid detective. And that myth endured for several generations in uh, American popular culture. Here we see um, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's uh, novel, The Valley of Fear. It's one of four Sherlock Holmes novels. Uh, the rest are short stories. The, sh the short stories are better. Uh, um, and in this novel, um, uh, there is a murder in an English uh, country house. And Sherlock Holmes solves that murder through an extended flashback to Pennsylvania, to the Valley of Fear, uh, presided over by a group called the Scourers, the Molly Maguires, who are the murderous inner circle of the ancient order of freemen uh, in Sherlock Holmes's novel. Actually, um, uh, Arthur Conan Doyle met Alan Pinkerton's son on a transatlantic crossing and heard the story of the Molly Maguires and borrowed the plot uh, for that novel. It's not a great novel. Uh, um, presiding over the scourers in um, the uh, Sherlock Holmes novel uh, is Black Jack McGinty. And he is based directly on John Black Jack Kehoe, the alleged ringleader of the Molly Maguires, who will come back into this story uh, later. The case is cracked by an undercover detective, John McMurdo, who infiltrates the ancient order of free men, ingratiates himself with the members, and brings the criminals to justice. In the 1930s, um, a period of renewed labor activism in the United States, uh, the interpretive tide shifted uh, uh, for the first time. Anthony Bimba, uh, the first book there, The Molly Maguires, uh, was the f he was the first historian to offer a major revision of the foundational myth. His book, uh, The Molly Maguires, published in 1932, restored the Mollies to the, c the only context in which they make sense, which is the concerted struggle between labor and capital in America's gilded, gilded Age, which is one of the most violent conflicts between labor and capital in world history here, here in the United States. Um, but Bimba was so um, determined to overturn the prevailing interpretation that he ended up uh, with a counter myth of his own. He turned the original myth on its head, but retained the elements of circularity and conspiracy. He transferred the burden of evil from Irish workers to their employers. But that approach left open the question of who killed those 16 men. Um, why did the employers frame 20 innocent men? Because they were evil. Or, to put it another way, because they were capitalist. At the same time, by collapsing all workers into a single category of innocent martyrs, Bimba ignored the class and ethnic diversity within the Irish community, uh, which Mark and I have uh, brought out in our own work. The first historian to really offer a, a nuanced interpretation, I think, was uh, Coleman, J. Walter Coleman, in um, 1936, reviewing this book, The Molly Maguires. I only found that yesterday. I was looking for a book cover. What I found instead was the review by Henry Steele Commager, the, the Columbia historian, very struck by the opening line, a uh, few things furnish a more illuminating indication of the changing temper of our time than the reinterpretation of the American labor struggle. And that's Henry Steele Coleman, you're looking at that in the 1930s. Uh, Coleman did two important things. Firstly, he identified Molly Maguireism as a distinctively Irish form of violent protest. And that's a theme I'll develop this evening. Secondly, he pointed out the basic problem with evidence that nobody had up to that point, which is that James McParlin was by profession a liar. That was his job. <laughs> he was a liar. He, he was an undercover detective who, who uh, deceived people. And so taking his reports as the basis of the historical uh, narrative about the Molly Maguires is, to say the least, problematic. Um, 
each generation produces its own interpretation of the Molly Maguires. There's been uh, one every book, uh, one every generation. There must be one forthcoming, uh, um, but we'll talk about that later. Uh, in 1964, Wayne Broll um, published his book, which was the standard account before mine, and that's, that's quite some time ago. Uh, he was good on bringing out uh, the character of Franklin B. Gowan. Franklin B. Gowan was one of the minor robber barons of the Gilded Age. He was president of the Philadelphia uh, Reading Railroad. It was he who hired the Pinkertons to send uh, MacParlin in undercover. I, t I found Broll's book uh, good on business history, less persuasive actually than Coleman's in the 1930s on the Irish background, very much a product actually of the historiography of the 1950s rather than the radical 1960s. But of course, uh, I was predisposed as a PhD student to be critical of Broll because he had written the standard work and I was hoping to write the new one. I would say now, a generation later, uh, now that my doctoral megalomania has subsided and is behind me, uh, <laughs> that I would be inclined to see more merit in his work than I gave him credit for uh, at the time. Now, some uh, friends appearing uh, in the uh, movie uh, in 1970. And uh, one of the great things for the graduate students here was wh when I was writing my dissertation and got bored, I could just put on the movie and, and, see, and see what they had to say. In the, the film version in 1970, um, you see Sean Connery uh, uh, playing uh, John Kehoe, Richard Harris uh, playing uh, the detective, Mike Parlin, Malachi McCourt uh, playing the bartender, for those of you who know Malachi, <laughs> uh, that's a, a side note. Uh, in that rendition, um, finally the informer uh, becomes the villain, not the hero. So really the, the foundational story laid down by Alan Pinkerton a century before, it's always the intrepid uh, adventures of the detective and he is at the heart of the narrative. In this, uh, in the film rendition, in the climactic scene, uh, MacParlin goes to John Kehoe in his death cell and Kehoe responds, you came for absolution, punishment, that's what you want. You think punishment's all that can set you free. And Keogh pounces on MacParlin, that's Sean Connery on Richard Harris, thrashes him until he's hauled off by the guards. Are you free now, Keogh demands. You'll never be free. There's no punishment this side of hell can free you from what you did. Now, there's an interesting footnote to American cultural history in that film because the film's director, Martin Ritt, and the producer, Walter Bernstein, who taught here at NYU Tisch until just before the pandemic, up to the age of 99 or 100, and we always wanted to get him here to Ireland House. Martin Ritt and Walter Bernstein had been blacklisted in the McCarthy era. They saw their film in part as a response to Elia Kazan, who, as you may recall, uh, cooperated with HUAC and named names, and whose hero in p probably his finest film on the waterfront uh, played by Marlon Brando, uh, famously informs against corrupt uh, union bosses. So there's a real cultural subtext going on there. Uh, the movie was a bit of a dud. <laughs> it was a flop. It did not have the impact that Ritt and Bernstein had uh, hoped for. But along with Coleman's book in particular, it did clear a path for the story that uh, I eventually told about the Molly Maguires. My interest in the subject had uh, modest beginnings. As a graduate student, I was assigned to write encyclopedia entries um, for Eric Foner and Jack Garrity's The Reader's Companion to American History. And I received 10 assignments. And this is the type of task that, as a graduate student, you take on eagerly. Generates a small amount of money, but it's your first publication. So I was, I was assigned 10 of these to write. I wrote nine of them, no problem. Couldn't write the one on the Molly Maguires. Because what you do is you go to the existing secondary sources and there was no agreement whatsoever on who they were, what they did, as Mark alluded to, even as to whether they existed. But I think I, I did complete it, and it's in that encyclopedia somewhere, but I spent uh, must, uh, much of the remainder of my time then at Columbia uh, investigating that story in great depth. The intellectual origins of the project were obviously uh, deeper than that. Um, as an undergraduate at the University of Edinburgh, 
I had read E.P. Thompson's The Making of the English Working Class. Um, I belong to the tail end uh, of the generation of historians who were um, decisively shaped by that book, Thompson's The Making of the English Working Class. Uh, as a graduate student, I came to realize that American immigration and labor were inseparable. Herbert Gutman, uh, who died early in New York City in 1985 at the age of 57, was the most prominent labor historian of that era. He founded the American Social History Project at CUNY, uh, with whom I had the pleasure to work uh, for several years. That's a project that produced the two-volume labor history of the United States, who built uh, America and a whole series of uh, public programs. So I was interested, as, as Gutman was, as Thompson uh, was, in doing um, what we call history from the bottom up, history from below, the history of what I sometimes refer to, borrowing from Dostoevsky's title, The Insulted and the Injured of the American Industrial Revolution. Uh, Thompson himself saw the Irish as a mobile pro proletariat that built the infrastructure of, of the Atlantic economy. So I was very influenced by that uh, going into the subject. But there was a problem. The Molly Maguires really present significant challenges for anybody who, who wants to write their history because they left virtually no evidence. We do not hear the Molly Maguires speaking in their own voice. Uh, there, indeed, there are only two letters in the whole archive that I used where, and one of them is a fragment, where I think it's the Molly Maguire speaking in, in, in their own voice. Nonetheless, I still wanted to set out to find out not only why did people dislike the Molly Maguires, but who were they? What were they doing? Why did they do it? What was their motivation? So that was the task um, I set myself in the book. Now, the starting place for understanding the Molly Maguires in Pennsylvania is the country where the Molly Maguires originated. You have to start in Ireland. And when I first encountered this remar remarkable story in Pennsylvania, I recognized a familiar pattern because I knew some Irish history as well as American history in which I'm trained. I saw that the pattern of violence in Pennsylvania conformed to something that I had already encountered in the, in the Irish countryside, down to the tavern keepers and bringing in strangers to do the job, returning favors, favors traded. All of that uh, struck me as very familiar. And I knew that um, the, to unlock the secret, I, I would have to start back in uh, rural 19th century Ireland. The first reports of the Molly Maguires in Ireland date to the 1840s and 1850s. And they were the last in a long line of secret societies that included groups like the White Boys, the Oak Boys, the Ribbon Men, the Lady Clares, the Lady Clares, the Molly Maguires. The men who joined these organizations wore female clothing, both as a form of disguise and to signify their allegiance to a mythical woman who symbolized their struggle. This is a report, uh, well-known uh, uh, Irish land agent, uh, uh, William Stewart Trench, um, who, um, these Molly Maguires were generally stout, active young men dressed up in women's clothing. That's a report from the book, the book published in, in 1868. So there were Molly Maguires in some form in Ireland. According to one story, a woman called Molly Maguire, was being evicted from her cottage, refused to leave when the bailiffs arrived. They flattened and leveled the cottage on top of her, and the men in the neighborhood got together to avenge her memory. According to another story, Molly Maguire was a woman, pistol strapped to each thigh, who led the men through the countryside. Uh, these are uh, great stories, uh, but they're found in too many parts of Ireland to be taken uh, literally. Among other things, Molly Maguire would have needed to be in several places at once. Uh, so the stories do make sense, however, uh, in the context of uh, rural popular culture. We know from the sources that the Molly Maguires in, in Ireland were men, not women, that they were so named because they disguised themselves in women's clothing, they used powder or burnt cork on their faces, they pledged their allegiance to Mistress Molly Maguire. The clothing 
and the makeup uh, were a form of disguise, but they were also a form of allegiance to the symbolic figure uh, on whose behalf the Molly Maguire was fighting. Now, that sounds odd, but that kind of popular violence was widespread in early modern Europe. It survived longer in rural Ireland than in most places. It survived also in Wales, where there was a group called the Rebecca's. It survived in the Pyrenees, where there was a, the Demoiselle d'Ariège. Uh, so it's not, it's not uh, such a huge aberra aberration, but it survives longest uh, in Ireland. Molly Maguire's took vengeance against those who broke their moral code. They uh, attacked um, farmers who enclosed common land with fences, who replaced tenants with animals, who converted tillage land to grazing land, uh, uh, farming animals for profit. Sometimes they maimed or killed the animals themselves as symbols of uh, commercial farming. They targeted tenants who took leases uh, uh, from uh, other tenants who had been evicted. They often um, operated under the cover of darkness, and officials in Dublin and London refer to them in one of my favorite um, phrases from the sources as midnight legislators. The midnight legislators was the, the term in the, in the outrage papers, Mark, that you'll have seen as well. Um, now, Irish immigrants carried some elements of this distinctive tradition with them across the Atlantic. On the canals, on the public works and railroads, later in the coal mines, the Irish fought back using these traditions. They fought back against their exploitation with violence. Often it was workers from one part of Ireland doing battle with workers from another. Uh, we, we call that uh, faction fighting fighting for access to employment, uh, sometimes destroying the work they had done, uh, just as members of secret societies in Ireland destroyed fences or dug up pasture land to make it fit for potato cultivation. Uh, hand grips, passwords, recogni recognition signs, oaths of secrecy, threatening notices, we see this popping up. Uh, in this uh, rough culture of Irish immigrants in the first half of the 19th century. Um, but uh, contrary to the conspiracy theorists, uh, there's no evidence that an organization was imported from Ireland, transplanted into Pennsylvania. None of the um, convicted Molly Maguires had criminal backgrounds in uh, Ireland uh, that I could find. Many of them came from the remote northwest county of Donegal, and they were Irish speakers, and they were alienated from their own uh, um, Irish ethnic uh, community in uh, important ways. Conditions uh, underground in Pennsylvania were appalling. The fatality rate in the coal mines was three times higher than in Europe. The Irish uh, immigrants were the most exploited of the mine workers, and they retaliated with a specifically Irish form of violence. Um, they did so under the uh, umbrella of the ancient order of Hibernians. Now, what emerges in the mining region is two different forms of labor organizing because the standard form of labor organizing in an industrial capitalist economy is not the secret society, it's the trade union. And Irish mine workers, including John Siney, were active in forming a union called the Working Men's Benevolent Association, the WBA. The Working Men's Benevolent Association, founded in Schuylkill County, mobilized 35,000 mine workers across the anthracite region with Irish leadership, John Siney and then John Welch. And that was on the model of one big union, if you know that phrase, one big union. So you will bring in workers regardless of skill level, whether they're laborers or skilled miners, regardless of religion, whether they're Catholic or Protestant, regardless of, of nativity, it doesn't matter if you're Irish, Welch, or American-born, 
the WBA was the largest and most powerful uh, trade union in the country in the 1860s and early 1870s. So that's one mode of labor organizing. Alongside it, um, lurking within the shadows of the ancient order of Hibernians was a much smaller, an exclusively Irish group of mine laborers, led often, as in Ireland, by tavern keepers, who favored direct violent action and became known as the Molly Maguires. Now, at a fundamental level, both groups, and they overlapped, both groups wanted the same thing. A, a letter uh, from an anonymous Molly Maguire uh, published in the Shenandoah Herald in 1875. It's one of the two surviving letters. Um, a quote from it, I have told ye the mind of the children of Mistress Molly Maguire. All we want is a fair day's wage for a fair day's work. And that's what we can't get now by a long shot. So a fair day's wage for a fair day's work is the same goal that the trade union movement has. The Molly Maguires share that goal, but the two groups go about the task in very different ways. The union men sat down as representatives of the working class across the table from representatives of the employing class, and they tried to hammer out an agreement. And if that didn't work, they had a very powerful weapon at their disposal. That was to go on strike and bring production to a standstill. The Molly Maguires took a much more local and individual perspective. If a mine operator was treating Irishmen unfairly by reserving the better jobs for the Welsh or by paying different rates for the same work, they dealt with him directly rather than through mediation or bargaining. First, they delivered a verbal warning telling him to cut it out. If he did not listen, they nailed a sheet of paper to his door with a coffin sketched on it, accompanied by the words, this will be yours. The coffin notice could be followed by a beating, and the ultimate sanction was assassination. The violent underground tradition to which the Molly Maguires belonged was born of desperation. It was sporadically organized at best. The union model, by contrast, was based on strength in numbers, based on collective bargaining, based on actually an outright condemnation of violence by the labor leaders, including the Irish uh, uh, leadership of that organization. The trade union was opposed to violence on moral grounds and on tactical grounds. They warned that the actions of a militant few would destroy the labor movement as a whole. Map there of Pennsylvania with the anthracite region uh, shaded and then a, a detailed map of um, the anthracite coal region. The point we need to understand uh, regionally, and you have to go into micro history to understand the story, is the anthracite region has uh, an upper and a lower uh, field. It, it has several, but we can divide them into upper and lower. In the upper field around Scranton, and it's probably the part of, of the Pennsylvania mining region that, that is best known. In the upper region around Scranton, a few major corporations had control over the production and the distribution of coal from the, really from the beginning. If you're walking down on, on the Hudson and you see the uh, Delaware and Lackawanna um, depot of the old railroad, the coal was shipped from northern Pennsylvania down to New York City. In the lower region, things were very different. The, for geological reasons, it was much harder to extract the coal. They really couldn't make it profitable until they started deep shaft mining. The economic structure is that you've got um, literally hundreds of small coal operators. The, one of the main sources for my a newspaper called the Miner's Journal. Miner's Journal is the newspaper of the small independent businessmen. They are the miners. It's not the, uh, the workers' newspaper. So you have hundreds of small operators um, into the 1870s. Into that picture uh, comes uh, Franklin Benjamin Gowan, the president of the Philadelphia and Reading Railroad, determined to achieve in the lower region what has already um, 
become the norm in the upper region, which is to say big corporate control over not just the distribution of coal, the carrying of coal, but actually the production of coal. Gowan has a few obstacles in his path. The least of them is that his corporate charter forbids the Reading Railroad from owning coal mines. Well, that's an easy enough problem to get around in the Gilded Age. So through bribery, he solves that problem in the legislature. The two fundamental obstacles in his path are the small operators, the independent businessmen, and the labor movement. He eliminates the small operators. By the mid-1870s, there are only 30 of them left at the start of the process. There were 160. And then he targets the labor movement. And Gowan's strategy is to argue that the Molly Maguires are simply the terrorist wing of the trade union movement. And this is against the highly vocal opposition of the trade union movement to violence on moral grounds and on tactical grounds. Gowan's strategy, and it's a successful one, is to collapse that distinction and say that the, tra the trade union movement is operating through the Molly Maguires as its, as its terrorist wing. You see, that move once again equips the Molly Maguires with an institutional structure. Either they're under the OAH or they're under the uh, WBA, the union. Either way, they're much bigger than they actually were. It's in that context that Pinkerton sends uh, James McParlin into the mining region in 1873. McParlin spends 18 months there sending back uh, secret uh, reports, handwritten reports, going mailing them to Philadelphia every week. Uh, both of us have read uh, through all of those reports, and they are the basis of the Molly Maguire story. In 1875, uh, shortly after McParlin flees the anthracite region, uh, the labor movement goes down to final defeat. There's a six-month strike against Gowan and his railroad. It ends amidst uh, scenes of near starvation, the long strike, in the middle of the most severe economic depression that has ever struck the United States up to that point. That's the depression of the 1870s. In the disarray that follows, uh, six of the 16 assassinations attributed to the Molly Maguires take place. So if you look at this structurally, you'll see that the trade union in its heyday from 1868 to 1875 separates the two waves of violence. There was plenty of violence during the Civil War. There was a period of relative stability. The labor movement falls apart into the vacuum step. The Molly Maguire, six of the 16 assassinations in the summer of 1875 alone. That same anonymous Molly Maguire, if we can trust it as a source, writes in 1875, uh, I'm against shooting as much as you are but the union is broke up, and we have got nothing to defend ourselves with but our revolvers, and if we don't use them, we shall have to work for 50 cents a day. And that letter closed on a defiant note, warning that the children of Mistress Molly Maguire would make it hot as hell for the employers if they did not relent. But it was the labor movement that went down to crushing defeat in 1875. January 1876, the arrests began. The defendants were arrested by the private police force of the Reading Railroad, known as the Coal and Iron Police, assisted by Pinkerton agents. They were convicted largely on McParlin's evidence, uh, supplemented by the confessions of a series of informers who turned state's evidence. More than 50 alleged Molly Maguires went on trial between 1875 and 1878. Um, the defense went through the motions <laughs> at best, so to speak. Uh, the defendants were tried in groups. They rarely, if ever, uh, only one example I know of, testified on their own behalf. In effect, the AOH uh, was put on trial. Mere membership in that organization uh, was presented as de facto uh, membership of the Molly Maguires. Most of the prosecuting attorneys at the trials worked for railroad and mining companies. Franklin Benjamin Gowan himself appeared as the star prosecutor at several of the trials. His courtroom speeches were rushed into print as popular pamphlets. The trials were conducted in the midst of enormously hostile local and national publicity. The executions on Black Thursday, June 21st, 1877, were carefully choreographed so that the offended majesty of the law 
could instill terror into the inhabitants of the mining region. Ten men were hanged on a single day, six in Pottsville, four in the town that today is known as Jim Thorpe, after, after the Native American athlete was known more prosaically than as Mulch Chunk um, in the 1870s. In the turmoil that followed, um, the ancient order of Hibernians disowned the Malton Maguires and resolved its decades-long conflict with the Catholic Church over the question of secrecy. Taking an oath in, in and of itself was objectionable. Official histories of the AOH published in the late 19th century uh, made no mention that those local lodges had even existed in, in uh, Schuylkill County. As for the Reading Railroad, uh, Franklin Gowan won his battle, uh, but he did not win the, the war. Uh, like almost everybody else in the lower region, he could not turn a profit from mining anthracite. The geological problems are too uh, formidable. They were not really overcome until uh, the advent of mechanical diggers in the, and strip mining in the 20th century with all sorts of devastating consequences from that. The Reading Railroad uh, went into receivership. It was brought out by J.P. Morgan. Uh, Gowan was removed from the presidency. He returned to private law practice, a disillusioned man. On Friday, December 13th, 1889, uh, Gowan purchased a pistol, went to his hotel room in Washington, D.C., and shot himself in the head. Rumors flew that the Molly Maguires had finally taken their revenge but the newspapers eventually conceded that he had committed suicide. A century later, descendants of the Molly Maguires in Schuylkill County organized a campaign to win a posthumous pardon for John Kehoe, the alleged uh, ringleader. In that second letter from a Molly Maguire that I mentioned, which is just a fragment, uh, in 1878, uh, Kehoe notes that by bribery, perjury, perjury, by bribery, perjury, and prejudice, I am under the sentence of death for a crime I never committed. Uh, his descendants, Alice Wayne, his, gra his granddaughter, and Joseph Wayne, the proprietor of the Wayne Hotel in Gerardville, where I went when I was doing the research, uh, uh, that's Kehoe's old, old tavern, along with members of the Pennsylvania Labor uh, History Society, um, won a posthumous pardon uh, for Kehoe. And um, Governor Milton Schaap of Pennsylvania in, the, in 1978 wrote that we can be proud of the men known as Molly Maguires because they defiantly faced allegations which attempted to make trade unionism a criminal conspiracy. All Pennsylvanians, Schaap wrote, joined with the members of the Pennsylvania Labor History Society in paying tribute to these martyred men of labor. Now, the Molly Maguires were indeed uh, martyred men of labor. 20 of them died on the scaffold. Some of them were probably innocent. Others may have been guilty as charged. Others still were probably guilty of other things. We just don't know. We can never know for, uh, for uh, certain. What we do know is that they never existed as the vast organized conspiracy that Franklin B. Gowan and others described. So in closing, I just want to offer a few reflections on more recent uh, interpretations of the subject, uh, given that it's been 25 years. Um, each generation uh, since the 1870s has uh, produced a new history. So it's high time that somebody challenged and debunked me, but I shouldn't be, um, be uh, issuing a 25th anniversary edition, somebody should be out there writing that book, uh, uh, debunking me. It hasn't happened uh, uh, fully yet, though, though other works have been uh, published. Um, the first of them, uh, Mark Bulick's uh, The Sons of Molly Maguire, The Irish Roots of America's First Labor War, published by Fordham University Press in 2014. Um, presented important new information on labor activism and popular protest, especially in the early phase of the conflict, as I read it, especially what was going on locally uh, during and after the Civil War, and then connecting Molly Maguireism to the tradition of mummery in uh, parts of, um, of rural Ireland. 
Secondly, Brandon McSivna's book, The End of Outrage, uh, published in 2017, very good book too, uh, revealed a deeper and broader tradition of Molly Maguireism in Donegal uh, than I was aware of. And the, that title, The End of Outrage, is actually a, a triple pun. Uh, it refers to the goal of Irish agrarian protests, the end, in that sense, what they were seeking to achieve. It refers to the termination of that long tradition by the famine, and it refers to the failure of subsequent generations to recognize or even remember uh, what had happened. It's a very um, passionate book in, in that respect. So Making Sense of the Molly Maguires was, my own book, was resolutely skeptical in its approach to historical evidence. And I'd say that 25 years later, I retain that skepticism about what the sources can tell us, but I think I confront more directly the fact that the Molly Maguires uh, killed people. I've given many public lectures on the Molly Maguires over the years, including one inside the old jail museum in Jim Thorpe, next directly uh, outside the cells where four condemned Molly Maguires were held on the eve of their execution on Black Thursday. And my message in that lecture that the Molly Maguires were real uh, is not always the one that my audiences expect or want to hear. <laughs> um, and yet, while we can never know if every man uh, convicted was guilty as charged, um, the Molly Maguires did act as a group to avenge themselves against their enemies in ways that made sense to them. So I emerged from this realizing that historical inquiry um, rests on empathy, an attempt to understand what made sense to others. And, but most of the empathy in my book, Making Sense of the Molly Maguires, is for the downtrodden Irish. Empathy, though, is not the same in my mind as sympathy. In other words, to explain a historical phenomenon is not to justify it. Historians do not sit as judge and jury on the past. They try as far as possible to make sense of the past on its own terms. In the case of the Molly Maguires, this involves an effort to understand the violence, not to condone it, not to condemn it, to understand uh, the violence. In making sense of the Molly Maguires, I was not asking whether people's actions were right or wrong. I was seeking to determine what they did and why. And I would say in teaching this book over the last quarter century, the one time where that line between explanation and justification grew uncomfortably narrow in the classroom was in the aftermath of September 11, 2001, when I sometimes had to explain that I was seeking to understand the Molly Maguires, not to defend their actions. And it was challenging at that time, can still be challenging to teach other similar topics, including the Haymarket Affair in 1877, when unknown anarchists uh, bombed uh, a square in Chicago, or the better known Sacco and Vanzetti case uh, of the 1920s. Since the book's publication, uh, industrial labor has become less prominent in American historical writing, and the field of immigration history has moved in all sorts of rich and exciting uh, new directions. Nonetheless, uh, labor history in some form will remain important as long as we remember that people worked in the past. And the main themes of the book, class, labor organizing, nativism, cultural adaptation, history from below, remain central to immigration and to immigration history today. Making sense of the Molly Maguires had an impact in those fields, those scholarly fields of immigration and labor history. But I think the, one of the most gratifying things about the book is the correspondence I receive from readers beyond the university. Last week I lectured at Notre Dame. One of the students was a direct descendant of one of the men hanged, the Patrick Hester case. Um, some of these readers are descendants of the Molly Maguires or their victims. Uh, others worked in the coal mines or belonged to families who did. All of them, like me, are engrossed by this tragic episode in American history and the effort to make sense of why it happened. Thank you.
And I am very pleased to take questions if people haven't had enough of this. And uh, we will repair to a reception downstairs. Yes? Two questions. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I was listening to one with the Ku Klux Klan and the Night Riders, and the other yeah. one has to do with. Thank you. Yeah. Two questions. One has to do with the Irish Night writers and the formation of the KKK in this country. Yeah. And secondly, uh, I want to get back to how many, if there were many Ulster Protestants in the Molly Maguires. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one of the groups in Ireland were called the People of Day Boys. Mm -hmm. And then we think of the KKK as Night Riders and, and all the costumes. Yeah. But, but recently I was watching the History Channel and he said the KKK was founded around 1866 by a businessman, in, I forget, in state, Tennessee, let's say. I wonder if that was influenced by the Irish. And secondly, were there any, a lot of Ulster Protestants came to America. Were they working in the minefields? And if they were, were they involved in the Molly Maguires? Yeah, yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. And everybody heard, heard, heard the question. Uh, on the question of direct influence, I'd love to say no. <laughs> on the question of direct influence uh, between the, the Molly Maguire tradition and the Ku Klux Klan, I would love to say no. McParlin, when he, uh, he got the job by writing a long report on Irish secret societies in Ireland, and he did draw that parallel. Uh, because in, in the United States at that time, um, remember the white boys are the Bukali Bona. They're, they're dressed in white <laughs> smocks, and they're, they're putting uh, burned cork or um, white powder on their faces. Uh, it's a very uncomfortable uh, coincidence, but just a coincidence. There is, there is no uh, relationship between the Molly Maguires and the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, as for the Protestant uh, dimension, uh, I know a lot about uh, that history. I know it mostly from the 18th century. I've written a lot about the Protestant Irish in the 18th century. There would have been some migrants from uh, Ulster, and Donegal, of course, is part of Ulster, uh, but there would have been relatively few uh, Protestant Irish. In, in the story that I'm telling. It's largely uh, Catholic, Irish, um, minors. If you, I, I mentioned before that to really understand this, you have to go into a form of what we call micro history, where you go really, really into detail. Um, there were lots of gangs uh, out there. Uh, the Welch had a gang uh, called the Madox. Uh, and I came across a gang uh, called the Sheet Iron Gang. And they were Irish. But they allied themselves with the Madox against the Molly Maguires, and that was a mystery. So I was trying to find out. It's very hard from the sources to know where people come from. So the census record will say Irish, but it doesn't tell you the county. And then I got lucky <laughs> looking at the census records for Cass Township, which, which uh, Mark knows well, and one other. The census taker made a mistake. He asked people, uh, where are you really from? <laughs> you know, he, he, he actually wrote down a, a cluster of houses. He didn't write down Ireland. He wrote down Kilkenny, Donegal, Mayo. It was, it was just serendipitous, right? It, it has to have been a mistake. And then so, you know, he went for lunch, and the supervisor said, no, no, you're not, do you're not doing that quite right. But it survived in the record. And I was able to draw a correlation from that little fragmentary source. Uh, I was able to find out more about the Sheet Iron Gang. They were from County Kilkenny, a place called Fasadinum, a place in Ireland that has coal. And because it has coal, they had imported English miners in from Durham. And these were descendants of English miners, and they were Protestant. Now, they weren't Ulster Protestant, but they were Protestant Irish. And at the micro level, they took the side of the Welsh and the Madox against those fearsome Molly Maguires. <laughs> so it's, it's extraordinary what you can find from the fragmentary sources. Um, Ted, yeah. Uh, wonderful uh, presentation and lecture. I had read the book. Uh, wonderful presentation, thank you. And I had read the book some time ago and really enjoyed it. And you bring home all the relevant issues. I guess two part question. One was the actual union controlled by the Welsh more than the Irish, and was that a source of tension? And secondly, you know, in terms of good jobs and so forth. And secondly, when exactly did the unions become effective in withdrawing their labor and having real leverage with the owners? Thank yeah, yeah uh, thank you, Ted. So the, um, if you look at the structure of the labor force in, in the mining region, it, we, just, we just refer to miners, but w within the ranks of, of miners, there were significant distinctions. 
you had a skilled elite of contract miners. And their job actually was to open and create the mine in the first place so, so that coal could be removed. You then had a bifurcation in the labor force underground between miners who extracted the coal from the coal face, which was a highly skilled uh, job too because you, you just blow, blow the place up if you don't do it properly, and laborers whose job was to shovel the coal for the rest of the day in, into carts and would spend the day underground. Now, there is uh, an ethnic division corresponding to that, broadly speaking. Uh, the ultra-skilled contract miners tend to be Welsh, sometimes Cornish, uh, from tin mining, sometimes English. Um, the majority of the laborers are Irish, but there are Irish skilled miners, right? So, so it's quite complex. The leadership of the Working Men's Benevolent Association is Irish, and that's significant. John Siney and John Welch, the leaders, the guys in control, are Irish born. They're presiding over a union that is open and welcome to all workers, whether you're a miner or a laborer, whether you're a Catholic or Protestant, Irish, Welsh, British, English, it doesn't matter. That's the power of the union. How powerful was the union? Very powerful, I think, uh, at it, in its heyday. Powerful enough to separate the two waves of violence. Right, you had the violence in the 60s, you had the violence in the, in the 70s. The union, heyday of the union, mobilizing 35,000 mine workers across skill, ethnicity, religion, uh, 1868 to 1875. They can bring production of coal to a standstill, and they do through striking. And they're interested in a sliding scale whereby wages will be tied to, to, um, to coal production. So they really are quite powerful in the uh, late 60s, early 70s. Not powerful enough to withstand Franklin B. Gowan when he gets to work, uh, but, but quite powerful in their day. The most powerful union, I think, in, in the United States before the Knights of Labor, uh, which is on a, a similar... Uh, what we call an industrial union model where all workers, not just skilled workers, are mobilized. Charmaine. Hi, uh, thanks yeah. for this great presentation. Um, and I was wondering whether you could speak a little bit more to your source use and how you were able to construct a cohesive sense of group identity based on like the lack of you know, uh, the Molly Maguires having left their voices behind. Um, and if you could also expand a little bit more on like this skeptical use of sources <laughs> yeah, that you yeah. mentioned. Thank you. I've been wondering the same thing myself. Uh, so so uh, 25 years later, I, I mean, I did set out to write a history of the Molly Maguires. I had two letters, <laughs> um, one of them a fragment, and very little surviving from the, from the trial tra transcripts. So. I, what did I do? I read everything uh, that was written about the Molly Maguires at the time, and so I found, I found out an awful lot, more than I possibly wanted to know, about anti-Irish sentiment uh, at the level of uh, nativism and anti-labor sentiment. But that would not have been enough. It was not enough for me to find out what did other people think about the Molly Maguires. So in a fairly stubborn, hard-headed, positivist way, I still wanted to write my history of who were they, what did they do, and why. Now, this is an extreme example of what we call history from below because of the source base. So the first thing is I recognized the pattern, as I said. When I looked at, immediately when I looked at the Molly Maguires in Pennsylvania, I said, I've seen that before. In, in my knowledge of Irish rural history, I've seen something very similar. Uh, go, uh, going on, the tactics, uh, the whole structure, the organization, the role of the tavern keepers who were, in this case, former um, uh, mine workers themselves, the idea of bringing in people from a neighboring lodge to do the job, the, the favors, all of that, uh, I, I, I saw a pattern. Then I, I did very hard-headed uh, social history. I went to the uh, census, not the published uh, federal census, but the actual manuscript of um, the handwritten manuscripts that the census takers took. And I took two townships in Schuylkill County, Cass, uh, which Mark knows well, and a neighboring township, Blythe, 
And I, I set out uh, pre-digital, yellow pads, uh, pen and paper, to get a correlation between uh, class and ethnicity. So uh, were the Irish uh, clustered disproportionately in unskilled work? And then when I got that smoking gun, that unexpected source of regional variation, could I get a little bit of regional variation in there? I did um, surname analysis. It's not scientific, right? But I had, there are about 50 Molly Maguires implicated in the story as I tell it. I had uh, direct evidence from newspapers and court cases on the county in Ireland where 14 of them were born. And so I wanted to know, did the pattern that I was seeing in that 14 uh, play out more generally? So one of the techniques I used, which is not scientific, but it was suggestive, was I looked at surnames. When I saw surnames like um, Boyle and Gallagher and O'Donnell and McGeehan, I knew that they must have come from Donegal, <laughs> right? Uh, so, so I, it, uh, and many of them did in the in the verified sources that I had. So I just mapped out the surnames. Now, the surnames, it, that's a more reliable form of analysis the further you go back in time, right? It's not it's not social scientific, but it's suggestive. And so, I did all of this work uh, pre-digital, without Ancestry.com, without I don't even know those notes. Uh, that I read for you. I must have typed them up from a piece of paper subsequently because I don't think I was word processing in the same way. So all of, all of it uh, pre-digital, all of it suggestive, and all of it my attempt to make sense of the Molly Maguires. So that's what I, that's what I was doing at the level of sources. So uh, in our field, uh, an extreme example of history from the bottom up or history from below. And uh, sitting there waiting for the next historian to demolish what I did, <laughs> but it survived this far. Um, yes. Uh, you mentioned at the end of the uh, trial that uh, membership in the ancient order of Hibernians was de facto evidence of uh, membership in the Molly Maguires, and maybe I missed it, but do you uh, find any relationship between the Molly Maguires and the AOH? Uh, was it perhaps a subset? Was it an unknown sort of cadre who yeah. met in the AOH? I'd my, yeah, my conclusion after all these years is that the local lodges of the AOH in Pennsylvania were used for violent uh, and not simply fraternal purposes. It's a bit deflating because that's what Mike Parlin said too. <laughs> but he, he had a different agenda from mine. Uh, the issue there is the prosecution at the trials and all of the nativist rhetoric surrounding the build-up to the trials. The argument is that the Molly Maguires and the AOH are the same and that you've got this uh, national and indeed international organization and that there's really is a major conspiracy going on here, so it magnifies the threat. But it seems clear to me that within certain local lodges, uh, uh, tavern keepers who were former mine workers and the workers themselves um, uh, uh, plotted certain activities uh, that, that did involve violence. So the story I mentioned of the student I met in um, Notre Dame who came to, to, to a lecture I gave, and she was descended from um, Patrick Hester, who's one of the 20 men hanged. And I, I read that, it's such a, a, a poignant um, uh, story. It's, it sticks in my mind 25 years later. So the three men who killed um, a mine boss called Alexander Ray, he was, he was carry, said to be carrying the payroll, right? They spent the night, uh, so the story goes, right? They spent the night in the tavern, in Pat Hester's tavern, I believe, all night. They came out in the morning, they hid in the bushes. And remember that like, the Molly Maguires would not have become Molly Maguires in New York City. It, it's the conjunction of two worlds, right? It's rural Ireland intersecting with the anthracite region of Pennsylvania, which is the heartland of the Industrial Revolution, but it's rural, like it's heavily wooded, right? So you have to get into, into that um, um, dimension to see it. So they hid behind the trees. They came out, they killed Alexander Ray, 
and it's, there's an Irish speaker, Manus Call, who's involved in, in that story. But the last line, in, indeed, the, uh, I close the section of that book with a quote from one of them saying, and the pity of it is that we killed the wrong man. Right, so, so, so that, that sticks in my mind so vividly to get at the, the sense of, of desperation, the sense of, of what happened to the Molly Maguires in the end was that they were uh, disowned by the twin pillars of their own community. The, the Irish-led labor movement opposed them, the Catholic Church strongly opposed them. So they're, they're outsiders even among the Irish. Um, I think we all deserve a drink, and I was like, <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, uh, Ted. Ted. There was one, and it was James McFarland. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. Uh, I w it, it seems pretty clear that uh, McFarland, uh, lo looking at all the sources, knew, knew of some of these killings in advance yeah. and was involved in the planning of one of them. So I'd say that McFarland was an agent provocateur. Uh, there were other Pinkertons active in the region, and the Pinkertons uh, launched a vigilante attack against the O'Donnell household, which is one of the Donegal households in which they kill a suspected Molly and his, his wife. So there's, there's violence on all sides in this story. There are two institutions that unequivocally oppose violence. That's the labor movement and the Catholic Church. Molly Maguire's are using it. The corporate capital is using it in the form of the coal and iron police. The Pinkertons are using violence um, in vigilante attacks. The state of Pennsylvania is deploying its monopoly over legitimate violence to hang 20 of these men. On that note, <laughs> we'll continue the conversation downstairs. Thank you so much. <laughs>